Good to see everyone here this morning. We'll begin uh, a series this morning on the Bible. So the Bible itself, particularly how God gave it and how we ought to receive it. So uh, just kind of an overview of where we'll be going. Uh, we'll give a brief introduction. Um, then we'll move into a section where we speak about the history of the Bible from the earliest times. And then we'll circle back and then look particularly at some important doctrines regarding the Bible itself. And then finally, we'll make some practical applications of what we learn. So first, why would we even embark on a study like this? Well, we say that the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice. And so it is. Um, that means that it's from the Bible and the Bible only that we learn about God, that we learn about Christ, that we learn about our sin, that we learn about salvation. We would know nothing apart from the revealed word of God. And this language that the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice, that goes all the way back even to the 17th century, those uh, Baptists in London. And the first London Confession, they said this, the rule of this knowledge, faith and obedience concerning the worship and service of God and all other Christian duties is not man's inventions, opinions, devices, laws, constitutions, or traditions unwritten whatsoever, but only the word of God contained in the canonical scriptures. And we say amen to that. So the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice. However, in the unbelieving world, skeptics continue to challenge the authority of the Bible. And uh, you just see this more and more. People uh, laugh at the Bible today. Maybe you've uh, posted some kind of biblical truth on social media. What comments do you get? You mean you believe the Bible? How foolish for anyone to believe the Bible today. This is what is instilled in most people's minds. Sad to say, there are even people uh, who call themselves Christians who cast great doubt and question on the scriptures. And uh, we'll, we'll look at some of that. However, also among believers, even among us, differences regarding this issue of Bible translation uh, that's become a source of contention. Um, at one point, this was just a theoretical issue, but we've seen it in our days. It's actually causing real division among our churches. So now, more than ever, we need to be able to give good answers to difficult questions about the Bible. There are some hard questions, and uh, we need to be able to give the answers. In particular, we need to be able to arm our children with the right answers. If we shy away from tackling the hard issues, um, that may work for a while, but when they go out into the world, they're going to encounter these questions. And if we haven't prepared them, uh, we're just setting them right up for great disappointment. They say, well, no one ever told me this. And so now's the time for us to learn to, to be able to give the answers to our children and to the world now. So let's just begin. What does the word Bible even mean? Anyone know what that uh, picture is of? That's of some papyrus reeds on the uh, banks of the Nile River. And that's what that word um, biblos in Greek actually refers to as part of a papyrus reed because you could take that and process it and turn it into something you could write on uh, before paper. This was a kind of something you could write on. And then that word took on the additional meaning of a book. So a biblos was a book. That's why, you know, you know if, you're a, if you're a bibliophile, you love, you love books. Or if you write a bibliography, that's a list of the books you use in a paper, so forth. We use that all the time. Um, and then in the plural, in Greek, that becomes biblia, or books. That went over into the Latin as biblia, went into the old French. Finally, it ended up in English as Bible. And when we say the word Bible, what do we mean? Just any collection of books? No, no. 
we mean the Bible, the Holy Bible. And that is what we're studying. The Bible is the Word of God. That's why it's precious. It's not a book written uh, by mere man, but God is its author. And we know that uh, this is, these are the two classic texts about the Bible that we look at. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is where this comes from. And that little phrase there, given by inspiration of God, is important. Actually, in the Greek, it's one word, theopneustos, which means God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. It's the very word of God. It is his breath, just as he spoke when he created the world. In the same way, he spoke in the Bible, and it speaks to us even today. Uh, the other classic text is what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's how inspiration works. And as I said, we'll circle back and really dig down into that doctrine. But this is speaking about how these inspired authors were moved along by the Holy Spirit when they wrote. So as to write down their, uh, they were writing, but nevertheless, they were writing what was the Word of God and all the authority that goes with it. Now let's just briefly think about the structure of the Bible. And I'm preaching to the choir here, I know. Um, but we have uh, two parts. The Old Testament, which is made up of 39 different books. And then we also have the New Testament, uh, consisting of 27 books. So the Old Testament is roughly the first two-thirds of your Bible. The New Testament is that last one-third. A total of 66 different books. Now, uh, the, uh, the Jews divide them up and count them differently, but it's the same books in the Old Testament as in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, you know, we have ours divided out as First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, so forth. They don't necessarily divide them that way, but it's the same books. So we have Old and New Testaments. What is even meant by that term, testaments? Why do we have an Old Testament and a New Testament? Well, that word testament means a covenant. That is an agreement between two parties, and this is. This is language that comes right out of the scriptures themselves. In Exodus, we read this. Right after Moses is delivering the, uh, the terms of the covenant to the people, the law that God had given him, we read this. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. There was a covenant between God and and his people Israel. And uh, yet, as time went on, we see prophets come and they begin to speak of a new covenant. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 31 says this, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And what is this new covenant? Well, Jesus himself at the Last Supper said, for this is my blood of the New Testament. That's the same word, covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus said that he inaugurated a new covenant, a New Testament. And it's not just with uh, a national people, Israel, but it's with believers, with his sheep. And uh, we enter into that covenant when we believe on him and we are saved. It's a much better covenant than the old. Um, so that's why we have the Old and the New Testament. So if you're, uh, maybe you have Jewish friends, they, they don't call the Bible the Old Testament. They, they call it the Hebrew Bible, but it's Christians who call it the Old Testament because we have the New Testament. These are the two uh, divisions of the Bible, but even within them, there are subdivisions. The way that we uh, organize uh, the scriptures is, is like this. First, we have in the Old Testament a section of law, the first five books of Moses or the, the Torah. 
Um, then we have some books of history that speak about the history of the, uh, the nation of Israel. Then we have books of poetry and wisdom, like the Psalms and Proverbs, etc. And finally, we have uh, the prophets, what we call the major prophets, the minor prophets. Uh, these are the prophecies that were given to uh, Israel. And one thing you'll notice about the Old Testament, it's not the proud national literature of a people. What it is, it's, it's a minority report of faithful prophets against a disobedient nation. It doesn't say how good the nation of Israel is. It says how bad they are. It says how they've broken the covenant. And it's warnings. It's full of threatenings. And uh, that's what the Old Testament is. But in the New Testament, we also have some divisions. We have the Gospels. And then we have a book of history. That's the the book of Acts. And then we have a collection of different letters that circulated uh, among the churches. And then we have that final book of prophecy in the Revelation. Now, what about the languages of the Bible? The Bible was written in uh, ancient languages, not in English. But the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and then some parts of Aramaic, which is a very closely related uh, language. And then the New Testament of course, was written in Greek. At, uh, see, the Hebrew language was the, the language of God's people, the nation of Israel. Aramaic was kind of the related language of that time. But then by the time of the New Testament, Greek had become the common language over a very wide region. And so uh, it was very providential that the New Testament was written in Greek. So it could be read across, uh, you know, basically any nation in the ancient world there. Take a moment to think about the custodians of the Bible. You see, these scriptures were not just thrown out into the ether, but they were given to particular people. The Old Testament uh, was given to Israel. They were, uh, as Paul says, they received the oracles of God. They were the custodians of the Old Testament, and that was by the design of God. Um, and But about the New Testament, the churches are the custodians of the New Testament. Those apostolic writings, the Gospels and those letters, where, did, where were they written to and how were they circulated? It was among the churches. And then uh, finally, let's just think about this. What is the theme of the Bible? The theme of the Bible. Well, as I said, the Old Testament was this uh, minority report of the, of the prophets. They were uh, rebuking national Israel, and yet they also spoke of a coming king, the Messiah, the one who would set everything right. And uh, another name for Messiah is Christ. So in the Old Testament, we see Christ promised. Everything sort of revolves around this figure of the Messiah, even in the most ancient parts. Uh, they're all pointing to this one who's coming. It's an amazing uh, theme that ties together the Old Testament. Well, that's also the theme of the New Testament. But it's not just promise there. Here, Christ is revealed. You see, the Lord Jesus came, and he was manifested visibly. And that's why the, the authors of the New Testament felt so impressed to write down what, he, what, they, what they heard Jesus say and why it was so important for them to, to transmit this. Because... They knew he was the fulfillment of what had been written. And this is the rest of the story. It was necessary. So Christ is the grand theme that unifies all of the scriptures. And uh, that's true even among all these different sections. The law provides a foundation for Christ. If it were not for the law, we wouldn't even have the, the vocabulary to describe what God has done, what Jesus has done to save us in his sacrifice. Those books of the history speak about the preparation of the nation of Israel to receive their Messiah. The books of poetry, we see aspirations of Christ and his coming. And uh, in the prophetic books, we see uh, an expectation of Christ. They're waiting. In the Gospels, we see Christ manifested. In the history book, that book of Acts, we see Christ in the Gospel propagated. 
in the letters we see Christ uh, interpreted and applied in the light of the Old Testament. And finally, in that last book of Revelation, we look forward to the time where uh, our experience of Christ will be consummated in his second coming and our uh, living with him. That's why Jesus said this, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He said, it's all about me. That's why it was necessary for these things to be fulfilled. And needless to say, Jesus was correct. That is the theme of the Bible. That brings us into this uh, first uh, section here, the history. So how did God give us the Bible? What are the details? Um, and what we're going to, we're going to draw primarily from the Bible itself. Do you know the Bible gives us so much information about how the Bible was given? Uh, so that's got to be our starting point. And then we'll bring in other information uh, as needed to help us put it together in one uh, continuous timeline. How did this happen? Let me ask you this. What is the first mention in the Bible of the writing of the Bible, of the Bible being written down? Think of that for a moment. What was the first time that the Bible itself, if you started in Genesis and began to read, where, where would the first time be when you see actually the Bible was beginning to be written down? It may not be exactly what you're thinking. The first mention, this was surprising to me, was following the battle at Rephidim. And you might say, what is that? You know the story. That is where uh, when Moses uh, held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Uh, and it was a great victory that the uh, children of Israel had over the Amalekites. And then right after that battle, we read this. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. <coughs> in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And so Moses wrote it in a book. And now uh, the, the form of a book is not like we have. We're talking about a, a scroll at this time, most likely. They had other uh, ways of writing things down. Back in that age, they had clay tablets sometimes they could write on. Uh, this seems to be indicating a scroll here. But the Lord told Moses to write it down. Why? Why write this down? For a memorial. To remember. This must be remembered. Okay, well, what's the second mention of the writing of the Bible? Uh, well, this is probably what you may be thinking about. Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai. This is a major event. I mean, this is one of... This may be the greatest event in the Old Testament for you know, the Jews. They look back to when they received the law, when Moses uh, received the law from God on Mount Sinai. And so we're going to look at some considerable detail at what exactly transpired at Sinai. So at first, you remember in, in Exodus 20, uh, they are preparing to go up into the mount and uh, God sends Moses back down out of the mount to warn the people not to come up. And then it says, the Lord spoke in Exodus chapter 20. He spoke the Ten Commandments. And evidently that was in the hearing of all Israel. It wasn't just to Moses, but they heard it. Uh, that's why we read in Hebrews that uh, they didn't want to hear it anymore. And this is what they said. In Exodus 20, and they said unto Moses, speak thou with us. In other words, you speak with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And then it says, and the Lord said unto Moses. So all the people were there. They heard the Ten Commandments. And they said, we don't, we don't want to hear from God anymore. And uh, they said, well, we're just frightened. We're afraid. The author of Hebrews says they didn't want to hear it because they didn't like what God said. Isn't it sad? 
But nevertheless, Moses would be the interceder. He would go and uh, receive the law here. So he's, uh, he's there with God in this thick darkness. God gives these laws of morality all the way through chapter, uh, the rest of chapter 20, 21, 22, through the end of chapter 23. Uh, much that God gave there. And then Moses comes down to the people. And uh, we read this. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. There it is again. Moses has received the revelation from God and he's writing it down. That's, it's important that this be recorded. Very important. And what else did he do? He took the book of the covenant. You see, he wrote it down and then he had it and he took it and he read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood. You see, he'd built an altar there and they had offered sacrifices. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. But that wasn't the end. That was only getting started. Uh, thus far, God had only spoken to Moses near the thick darkness. That's what it said. But now, God calls Moses higher up into Mount Sinai to receive further words. He's going to go up into the mount. It says uh, in Exodus 24, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables or tablets of stone, and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister, his helper, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain, mount, mount of God. So he's already uh, confirmed the terms of this covenant with the people. And now he's going up higher to receive further uh, instruction from the Lord. And that's when God gives the laws of ceremonial service to Moses, uh, particularly about the building of the tabernacle and all the uh, ordinances of the sacrifices. Uh, that God spelled that out to Moses in great detail, according to the pattern that was shown to him on the mount. That goes all the way to the, uh, the end of chapter 31. And then after he had given all these ceremonial laws, God gives Moses something else. He gives Moses two tables, two tablets of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Now, this, these tablets did not contain everything that God had said, but they contained those ten commandments because that was the terms of the covenant. That, and it's another word is the testimony. And so... We often think about the Bible in these terms, don't we? That God uh, drops down tablets written with the finger of God. And that is, that's how the Bible is. It is the, it's one and the same as if he has dropped it out of heaven on tablets right into our hands. He did that with Moses. But this is the only time he did it this way. Uh, the rest of the time, he was using inspired men to write down his word. But you see, it's all coming from the same source, from God. And it says this, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God, graven or engraved upon the, tab the tables. However, as Moses is coming down, with, think about this. Has there ever been any greater object to bring down to a people than tablets with the perfect law written by God himself? And he's coming down, but in just the 40 days and 40 nights that Moses was in the mount, the children of Israel had fallen into gross idolatry and immorality. It didn't take long. 
they didn't want to hear God. And when Moses was gone, they said, we don't even know what became of him. And that's when we read this. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing that they had made. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. He said, this people, they're not even worthy of the law. They're not worthy to receive it. How dare they blaspheme the God that's just delivered them out of Egypt? How could they do such wickedness? Nevertheless, Moses continued to intercede for the people. Uh, God said, well, I'll just make of you a great nation, Moses. And he continued to say, no, don't, don't destroy this people. The Lord then instructs Moses to cut new tablets. And then the Lord promises to write on these second tablets, tablets which he had written in the first tablets. Um, so that's exactly what Moses did. Thus, both sets of tablets were written with the finger of God. Uh, there's a verse that, if we read it uh, in isolation, might make us think otherwise, but it seems very clear that both sets of tablets were written with the finger of God. So Moses did that. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone, like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables. You see, I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. The goodness of God, the long suffering of God. He said, Just cut two more. I'll write on them again, and you'll have them. And so, uh, then the Lord spoke other words to him at that, that same occasion. And it says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words. And that uh, apparently is referring to these other words that God had said in that chapter. For after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables. We have to interpret that he is referring to God. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And then the tablets were placed in the ark. You remember the ark. That was uh, part of the instructions that God gave Moses was the construction of the tabernacle, but also this ark, this golden box with the cherubim uh, guarding it over the top and the mercy seat, all the details of that. The primary thing that was to go into that ark was these tablets. Uh, and that's what he did. He took the second set of tablets and placed them in the ark. That's why the ark is typically called the ark of the covenant or the ark of the testimony because it is the box that contains the covenant written with the finger of God. Let me read this. And he took and put the testimony into the ark. That's those tablets. And set the staves on the ark, and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the covering, and covered the ark of the testimony, as the Lord commanded Moses. So there we see, not only is God giving the word to his people, but he's telling them how to preserve it. He says, you take this, you put it in a particular place, you're going to put it in the most important place in your whole uh, camp, it's in the tabernacle. And there are all the regulations about even going into that building. That's where my word is to be. But also the entire law was placed in the ark. Moses also placed a written copy of the entire law in the side of the ark. And that would include the first five books of the Bible. That's what we call the books of Moses. Uh, or the Pentateuch, that just means five books. Or the Torah, that's the Hebrew reference to the first five books. And that word just means law. That's what Moses put, uh, not in the inner compartment, but in the side of the ark. We know that uh, from Deuteronomy. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book. Here we have Moses writing it down in a scroll all the words until they were finished that Moses commanded the Levites which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord saying take this book of the law 
and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. Moses, Moses knew that this people would be disobedient and rebellious. So he said, this is going to be there as a witness against you when you violate this law. So they put it in the sides of the ark. Again, right there, not only in the, the most uh, set apart and protected building, but in the most set apart part of that building, in the Holy of Holies. That's where the ark was. And right there with it was the copy of those first five books. See how holy the word of God is? See how uh, important it was to the Jewish people. So the first five books of Moses, that would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the names that uh, kind of came around in Greek that we use to refer to these first five books. But then that raises one other uh, question. And we'll just tra tackle this and then we'll be finished for this morning. What about Genesis? Genesis is a little different, isn't it? The first book of Moses is the book of Genesis, and that's a detailed account of the history of creation as well as the ancient genealogy of the Israelites. It raises the natural question, where did Moses get all this information? Where did it come from? I mean, he was there during the Exodus, and he was the eyewitness. That all makes total sense. But where did he... How did he even know about creation? And think about all the detailed genealogies and so forth that are contained in Genesis. What are we to make of this? Well, we know this. Moses was certainly writing his books under the immediate inspiration of God. I mean, from just what we read, God is the one that is ordaining all this, this whole process. And that's why these words are authoritative, because they're coming from God himself. So there's no doubt about his inspiration. And so the first possibility is that Moses, he may have just written the entire book of Moses without any other source material. Could the God who wrote on tables of stone with his own finger also have caused Moses to write out the book of Genesis? That would have been easy. That would have been, that's no problem for God. And of course, God knew all this. God knows everything. So there's no difficulty there. However, I don't think we can exclude this possibility. It's also possible that Moses may have used oral or written sources handed down from the ancestors of the children of Israel. And that wouldn't take away from what he wrote. And in fact, there's kind of a little hint that that may have been what was going on. Because we see in Genesis 5.1, we read this. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, and the likeness of God made he him. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is the book? That word means a writing, a document. And this uh, word generations is the Hebrew word uh, toledoth. It's speaking about an account. And there's, there are 11 of these markers using that same word throughout the book of Genesis. This sort of suggests a written source, because he said, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And we read, we read these markers in all these different places. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth. Uh, the book of the generations of Adam. These are the generations of Noah. These are the generations of the son of Noah. Uh, an alternate translation of that would have been, this is the account of Noah. This is the uh, account of Shem and so forth. Now, there's not, there's not much more that we can dig down and find out about this. Uh, nevertheless, if Moses did use any source material, then he functioned as God's inspired editor of these sources, you see. So, therefore, whether or not Moses used any source material, Genesis is God's authoritative account of creation and the ancient history of the ancestors of Israel. And so uh, we'll stop there for this morning, but uh, we'll go on to see uh, some more things in particular about this law. You see, it wasn't a law that was to be shut up 
in the ark and in the side of the ark, and no one ever comes and looks at it. No, 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 no. This is to be copied. This is to be read. This is to be read publicly. And there are laws about how you must do this. This is a, a word that's to be spread and read and sink down to the hearts of the whole nation. And there were particular ordinances about that. Thank you for your attention.